Happy Sabbath, Laguna Niguel Church family. I am so glad we are worshiping today together. No, we're not in our building, but we are together via our live stream and recorded service. You know, church can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to happen just at on Kensington Drive, but it's happening in your home, in my home, in our homes across Orange County. So I'm saying happy Sabbath to you. I want you to know that your church leadership, your pastoral staff, your leader, uh, elders and deacons, we're all praying for you. And we are all worshiping with you together. So happy Sabbath. Thank you for being here. Know that we have not forgotten about you. We want you to stay connected with our website, www.lnsda.com. And when you go there, you're going to notice at the very top of the page, there is a tab for Facebook, there's a tab for YouTube, and there's a tab for Instagram, and there's different tabs for different things. But I want you to click on that throughout the week, and you will notice that throughout the week, like today, we're going to have a 6 o'clock sunset prayer service. You can be a part of that if you'd like. On Wednesday, we have a 6 o'clock prayer meeting. You can be a part of that if you'd like. We also have on Friday evening a 6, 6.30 um, young adult led Bible study. And it is awesome. You can be a part of that. Our Sabbath schools remain the same. 10.30 right here in the sanctuary, and then 10.30 for the early teen and youth as well. Um, and all, you can get all the information that you need on our website. So stay in touch with the website. Go to the website frequently. If you have questions, that would be the first place to get the answer is on the website. If you can't get the answers there, you can always call one of your leaders, one of your pastors, myself, Pastor Mario, Elder Barbara, any of the elders or leadership team of the church. So we just want to stay in touch with you. We want you to know that we love you and we are continuing our service little by little on the website. Another service that we have started again is our grief share. If you would like to be a part of that, then you need to call me so I can add your email to the invitation. You know, during this time, it seems a little difficult to get those uh, return a faithful tithe like God requires an offering. But we are doing all that we can to make that a possibility for you. And an easy possibility. The easiest way we've found to do it is to go through online giving. And if you go to our website, once again, www.lnsda.com, there's a button there that says giving. If you press that, it'll appear an uh, envelope, tithe envelope that mimics the envelope that we see in church will appear, and you can give to the ministries that uh, you would like to give to, um, and add your offerings as well. Or another way that we can do it, just go ahead and mail it in. You can mail it in to the address that's on the screen now, and we would get it there as well. Or maybe you're just feeling anxious and you tired of being in the house and you just want to run by the church and drop it off in our secure box at the office. There won't be anyone here, but there will be a secure box for you to drop your tithe off as well. So there are three ways how you can return a faithful tithe and offering. The first is online giving, the second is through the mail, and the third is actually coming here and dropping it off yourself. And last but not least, certainly, if any of our members are in need of any of the things that they need to live, water, toilet tissue, food, please let us know. We do not want any member, any member, to be left out, to be overlooked. As we are calling our members systematically, from week to week and day to day. If you know of anyone, please let us know. Um, and you can reach out to us as well. Not just our members, but also your family. During this hard, difficult time, we know it's everyone that 
may be in need. And however we can help, we want to be there. But we can't help if you don't let us know. So God bless you and enjoy this worship service. Happy Sabbath to you.
thank you for today. I thank you for being a God who cares for us and loves us and for being with us. I pray that you will help us to trust in you during this time. I know that it can be very difficult and scary for a lot of us. And Lord, I pray that you will help us just have faith in you. Help us to know that you are in control and you have our best interest in heart. So I pray that you will help us to remember that, to never lose sight of that. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to love you and to not look at the things around us. You said that, yea, the like 10,000 may fall at a right hand, like nothing will come near thee. So Lord, I, I claim that promise and I pray that you will help us to be safe and secure in your arms. And even if like any of us were to get sick or something were to happen, Lord, I pray that you will help us to keep our trust in you and to never leave you nor forsake you. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Thank you so much, God, for being with us. We love you and thank you in your name, Amen. Good morning, church. I pray that you're doing well uh, as you're hunkering down in your home with your family. And I, I, I hope that you've been having good family worships. Um, it's always a good time. We uh, are starting to explore some of the uh, um, grace networks and aunt for Nita's for the little ones but during our family worships. But this is a good time to really jump into the word of God and enrich our family worships. And today we're glad that you're here with us. We can't be here in the sanctuary together, but we are here via the internet, in Zoom, in live streaming, and we are going to open up the Word of God today. So come and pray with me as we ask God's presence here as I speak to you and God's presence to rest on you wherever you are in your home. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for waking us up this morning when there are those that have not made it through this horrible virus, but you saw fit for us to be here today, Lord. Speak through me, Lord Jesus. May the Holy Ghost have its way, and we invite your presence into our hearts as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Today I'm going to be talking with you about the church, the ecclesia. And I'm going to be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Here Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea. Indeed, Laodicea was a city in Asia. Um, and in Revelation 3 here, we see there are seven churches listed. And these seven churches were about 50 miles uh, from each other. And each church representing a different time period in history down to the end until Jesus return. And Laodicea is that last church. You know, we are considered the age of Laodicea, the church of Laodicea. And when you look at it, it's sort of 
uh, heart-wrenching. It, it, it's a, a rebuke, a strong rebuke, that while Jesus had a praise report to all of the six churches, he didn't have that for the Laodicean church. That means that's our church. In fact, the Christian church in general, not just Laguna Niguel, but the Christian era is Laodicea. Not Laguna Niguel, not California, but all over the world, Laodicea, the Christian church. Hmm. I read Revelation 14 and I, 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 my heart rejoices because we see a church there that has the faith of Jesus and the faith in Jesus as well as keeping his commandments. But then we turn back to Revelation 13 and it's clear, it's undeniable that we are the church of Revelation 13. We are the lukewarm Laodicean church. And if we do not allow the Holy Spirit to make us into the people that we see in Revelation 14, we will be disappointed and we will not be in that number. How did the church, this Laodicean church, get so far off the beaten path? How did they become this lukewarm church? They went so far from the church that we see in Acts 3 and 4, the Kononia, that there was not a poor person in the church. They were all on one accord. Any need that was had, the church took care of. That's how tight they were. Like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they were united. No competition, but one in Christ. How did the church get that? Well, all we have to do is turn to Revelation 3. Let's go back to Revelation 3.17. Revelation 3.17, and it will tell us. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched. Because thou sayest, I am rich. Have mercy. Because thou sayest, I am rich. The two conditions are interrelated. When we look at the church, we can see the outward prosperity, but we cannot see the inward decay. But Revelation 3 lets us know there is indeed inward decay. All we can see is the prosperity. All we can see is that thou art rich. In fact, if Laodicea was a church right here in 2020, and I hope no church is, is named Laodicea, but if, there, if it were a church here in 2020, other churches would be looking to it to try to model it because from the outward appearance, they had it going on. They were rich. They were in need of nothing. They were prideful and boastful, but they were doing it well. And everyone said, man, that's the church that we need to be like. But Jesus tells us here, not so. You are a wretched, rotten, decaying church. He had no praise for them like the other churches, there was no praise for being trustworthy and faithful and true and generous and kind. But he, all only thing that he could say to them is, thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And you don't even know it. Have mercy. Jesus wants us, warns us about the evil of money and the decay that it can cause on our spiritual soul. And, and, and I want us to be clear on this. As we will see in scripture, 
In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it's interesting here how God says, uh, 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 Jesus juxtaposes the two. He says, you cannot serve two masters. And the two masters he's talking about is himself and money. Uh, Money is not uh, inherently evil. It is not the enemy of God. It is just the opponent of God. It's not uh, that money all by itself um, is wrong. If money were evil, we would not see religious and righteous people throughout the Bible using it. Uh, Even Jesus himself um, told Peter to go get some and pay the taxes. So it's not the physical makeup of money that is evil. But what is it? Well, I submit to you, it is the spirit behind the money. What do you mean the spirit behind the money? You see, um, Money is, is just money. That's just what it is. But when we serve the money, like Jesus said in Revelation 17, he says you cannot serve two masters. When you are serving something, you're giving your all to that. Jesus says, serve me. So all we need to do is look at the service that God wants us for him to give us or his give, he wants him to give us his whole heart, our whole heart to him. He says in, the, on the, in uh, uh, Exodus 20 that I'm a jealous God. I, there's not room for anyone else at the top but me. He's a God that wants our whole devotion. And when he uses the word here, serve, that is what he's talking about with money. You cannot serve two masters. Unfortunately, we see, when we're looking at the, uh, the Laodiceans, they somehow missed that. And, and they started serving money. And it's really, it's really no, um, it's no surprise, even today, when you turn on the television and you see these, the big churches, um, they're always talking about what money can do for you and how you're, your focus should be on being rich. And how if you're not rich, something is wrong. It goes contrary to the word of God. And you can see, you start to see, all you have to do is sit back and look, and you can see how money and God are competing. They're competitors. And Jesus said it time and time again. You cannot serve both masters. You must choose one, either money or or me. I require your all, and money requires your all. What will you do? I like the way that Watchman Nee puts it in his book, Love Not the World, in chapter, chapter 6. He says, who would dare st- say, and he's, he's referencing Matthew 24 here, when Jesus is talking about the end of the world, which the Laodicean church is. He says, who would dare say, that you do wrong to eat and to drink? Who would dare disapprove of marrying and giving in marriage? Who would question your right to buy and sell? These things in and of themselves are not wrong. The wrong lies in the spiritual force behind them, which through their medium presses relentlessly upon us. The spiritual force behind them. Money is a powerful force. It can be a powerful force for good or a powerful force for evil. But friend of mine, too many times, time and time again, we see that it being the powerful force for evil. Matter of fact, it is so powerful that it's one of Satan's primary means to snatch our souls and our allegiance from God to him. Jesus bought us with his blood, and Satan bought us 
with materialism. And we have wholeheartedly bought into that. Not just the world, but the church as well. It's no wonder when the church, when the world looks at the church, they said, there's no need for me to to go there. They are seeking after the same thing I'm seeking after. They serve the same master I serve. They just do it in a different form. Money is God. And that is why Jesus speaks so strongly. He warns us so vehemently about the evils of money. In Matthew 19, 24, Jesus tells us, it is easier for, you, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Mercy. And we will see that all throughout the, the, old, the New Testament. But we don't like to talk about that because we know money is needed. Even the church, we need money. But we shouldn't serve money. And this is the point. It's the service of money, the spirit that is behind this. Money was so important to the Laodiceans. And this is a church now. Laodicea is a church. A church that Jesus was directly talking to and talking about. It wasn't the world. He's talking about the church. Jesus, the money was so important to the Laodiceans that they perverted the clear teaching of Christ to avoid the warnings of the evil of money, greed, and materialism. In 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs for the love of money. All Satan does is just dangle that thing. The prosperity of being on the Forbes 100 list. The prosperity of making just 20,000 more. And we seek and long after. We sit and we make plans on how we can get it. And the Bible clearly tells us in Matthew 6.33 that seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not money, but money requires that. When you serve money, it requires all of you not just some of you. And Jesus says it again. You can't serve God and money. Serve me, and I will give you all that you need. Materialism is of Satan. It's not neutral like we like to, like so many people like to say. It is demonic straight from Satan to destroy God's church, as we see in the lukewarm church of Laodicea. Materialism is the tendency to consider material possessions as more important than spiritual values. I remember I was a material person, didn't even realize it. I used to think that I can't be materialistic. I can't be a greedy person. I don't have money. And God had to tell me it's not about the amount. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred million or a hundred dollars. You can still be a materialistic person, and that is not of God. God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah one day, and he sends his angels to tell Lot and his family, leave the city, I'm going to destroy it. And as Lot and his wife and his two daughters are fleeing the city, Lot's wife looks back just one more time to see that wonderful, magnificent city that she loved so much. And the Bible tells us that instantly she was turned into a pillar of salt. Lot's wife, my goodness, turned into a pillar of salt because the allure of that rich, prosperous city Sister White tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 161, that her heart clung to Sodom and she perished with it. She rebelled against God because his judgments involved her possessions and her children in the ruin. 
Although so greatly favored in being called out from the wicked city, she felt that she was severely dealt with because the wealth that it had taken years to accumulate must be left to destruction. Hmm. Instead of thankfully accepting deliverance, she perished. That's what happens when we serve money. That's what happens when we do not heed the warning that Jesus gives about the love of money. You know, Lot's wife was the charter member of the church of Laodicea. She was lukewarm. She wasn't cold enough to remain in the city with the sinners, but she wasn't hot enough to go where God had told her for deliverance. She was lukewarm, and because of that, she perished. What a, uh, a, a, a testimony to us today. We too can't be lukewarm. We too can't be lukewarm or we will end up in the same place. My friends, that reminds me of what happens when you freeze. You know, <clears throat> when a person freezes, even if they have enough water, and food, if you are in cold temperatures long enough, uh, you will end up freezing to death. In fact, what happens is when you're in the elements long enough, the, the, the surface capillaries in the, the hands and the feet, they start to um, construct and sending the blood away from uh, the skin and the hands and the feet getting closer to the torso to protect the vital organs, and your fingers and your toes become numb. And even as they ache with frostbite, the blood still goes because it's starting to freeze, and it needs to protect the vital organs. When your temperature drops below 95, the enzymes in the brain become less efficient, and amnesia begins to set in. At 91, apathy comes, and at 90, a stupor starts to set in, and you are now in the state of profound hypothermia, the condition of having a dangerously low body temperature. You realize that for some time, you have been shivering, an automatic involuntary response from the muscles in your body, an attempt to generate body heat. And at 88 degrees, when hypothermia becomes critical, shivering stops. The body is giving up. The final stages before death, the heart becomes arrhythmic, pumping less than two-thirds of the, the normal amounts of blood. Lack of oxygen and, and slow metabolism triggers hallucinations and you start seeing things that were not there. Here is the diabolical part. As freezing kills, it offers a perverse salvation. The illusion of warmth and comfort. You start to believe that you're on a nice, beautiful, warm beach enjoying the sunlight on your faith, face. All the while you're dying, lukewarm. That's Laodicea. You imagine yourself safe and cozy and you stop fighting. You stop resisting. You give up and you give in and you accept your dead condition and you slip quietly into death. Ah, mercy. The old adage of hypothermia is you are not dead until you are warm and dead. That is Laodicea, my friends. Laodicea, don't even realize you are dying. 
And I guess we, get the, we have the question answered. We, we can see how uh, being lukewarm is not better than being cold. But lukewarm, as it relates to freezing, happens just before you are sure enough dead, dead. Hmm. But God does not, Jesus does not simply tell us that you're wretched, you're no good, you're hopeless and helpless, and shame on you. No, our wonderful, blessed Jesus doesn't do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He never leaves anyone without hope. In Revelation 3, 19 through 22, he tells us, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Hallelujah. Jesus does not leave us by ourselves. He does not leave us in a lukewarm state. He warns us, and then he says, if you want to get out of it, I'm here. I have my hand out. I'm knocking on your door. And unlike the church of Sardis, where he gives a general appeal to the church, he's giving a general appeal to you. He's giving a a specific appeal to me, a specific appeal to you. He's worried about just that person. Our salvation is between us and God. And the impetus for him doing this is, like he says in verse 19, as many as I love, he loves us. That is why he's doing it. He loves us. He's knocking at our door. We don't have to be a slave to money. We don't have to be a slave to this world. Yes, we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world. Oh, materialism doesn't have to be our God. And when we give our all to Jesus, when we say, I will serve Jesus and not money, we, like Job, can say this. Job 1.21. You remember the story of Job, don't you? He was a rich man. Oh, yes. He was a rich man. He was the richest man of his time in that area. If you needed a job, you had to go to Job. Job had thousands of camels and sheep, everything. He was a rich man. But one day, he lost it all. He lost all of his money, all of his sheep, his cattle. He lost all of his family but his wife. And he even lost his health. And what was Job's response? Oh, my money, where did it go? I can't believe it. I'm going to be poor. No. His response was, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When we give all of ourselves to Jesus, then he knows that we belong to him. Not, 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 not just uh, this or that, but he wants to, we give all of ourselves to him. We belong to him. And then he knows that the money that we have belongs to him as well. Oh, friend of mine, will you heed the warning of God? Don't do like we do, like we've done, you know, we've... Uh, Change the theology of tithing to say that, well, as long as I give God 10%, um, I'll be okay. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's not, that's a. And all of us belongs to him. That tithe is just a token to say, yes, God, I all belong to you. If you want 20, I'll give you 20. 
30, I'll give, if you want it all, I'll give it all to you. Why? Because I belong to you. It's just like the Sabbath day. We keep one day because we belong to him. All of our time belongs to him. All of it belongs to him. That's what we must be. You can't serve God and mammon. And if you just, just, just take a look, stop and think, listen, what is the God of this world? Is it Jesus and him crucified, him risen and the soon returning king? Or is it money? You be the judge. And when you find out that the God of this world is money, repent if you see it in yourself. Friends of mine, who believes the word of God today? God loves you, and he wants you to be a part of his kingdom. He wants you to be a part of that kononia where we are so united with Christ that no matter what he asks of us, we will give to him. He wants us to be so in love with him that he can dump millions in our lap and know that I dump it in their lap and it's going to go to where I need it to go. It's not going to go into to the banks. It's not going to go into to, 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 to the, the storehouses like the rich young ruler where Jesus, when he asked Jesus, what can I do to be saved? He said, sell all your money. Oh, that was too much. Oh, friends of mine. If all church, if we were so connected with God that we were all faithful stewards of the money he gave us, if we were servants of God and not servants of money, what good could be done in this world? Hmm. Well, friends, God bless you.
Father God, we thank you for being a God that has left us with this instruction book called the Bible, this love letter called the Bible, Lord. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord, where we have fallen to uh, the temptations to love money more than we love you, to serve money more than we are serving you. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and we commit ourselves to you once again today that we will always serve you with your help, that, Lord, we, when we have the temptation arises for us to turn from you and start serving money, that we will say, no, Lord, give us the strength that we need to stay on that right path, Lord. And, Lord, I praise, I'm praying now for those that have been on that right path, I pray for those like Job who you can trust with money because they do use it for your good, Lord Jesus. May this church be a church that uses money for the good. We love you and we expect in your soon return because you alone are our savior. You alone are our master. You alone we serve. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.